When many of us in clinical medicine think back to our own training years, we often recall interacting with master clinicians who were skilled diagnosticians, thoughtful teachers, and role models of a compassionate bedside manner. What lessons do these master clinicians have to teach the rest of us in terms of how they learn, how their minds work, and how they became so good at what they do? I'm Vivek Murthy. Welcome to the Master Clinician Project. What follows is an interview with Dr. Nora Goldschlager. Dr. Goldschlager is a practicing cardiologist and professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. She is the chief of clinical cardiology at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, where she's cared for patients with cardiac ailments for over 40 years. Dr. Goldschlager is a giant in the world of academic cardiology with an international reputation for her clinical expertise. She's a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and master in the American College of Physicians. She has authored or co-authored more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and has written or edited 10 textbooks. Those of us here at UCSF who've had the privilege of training and caring for patients under her watch have come to know her for her incredible teaching efforts, her electric sense of humor, the fun and safe learning environment she creates, and her insistence against any fuzzy thinking or diagnostic imprecision whatsoever. When I think back to my intern year rotating through the cardiac care unit, I remember Dr. Goldschlager's technical and clinical expertise, certainly, but what sticks out to me in particular was her laser focus on the social history of each patient and how our treatment should always be tailored towards patient-centric endpoints like functioning, independence, quality of life, and happiness. This interview contains glistening pearls, plenty of inspiration, and a few good laughs. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Dr. Goldschlager, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Let me start by asking, where did you complete your medical training? Was it here in San Francisco or were you on the East Coast? I went to NYU for Bellevue. Mm -hmm. And there was, I don't know what it was. My father was a cardiologist, by the way. <clears throat> so I was going to be a cardiologist from the age of eight. <laughs> and two weeks of my life did I say, maybe I should do something else. I majored philosophy at Barnard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was offered a Wilson and all of that. And I decided, nah, there's no future here. I'm going to be a cardiologist like I was going to be when I was eight. Something always drew me to city hospitals, even though my dad was a cardiologist at um, a non-city hospital. And I never really wavered. I never wavered from city hospital. If you are a city hospital person, that's who you are. So that was the 60s. So I went to NYU for that reason. Our supervisors were the nurses, who often knew more than we did, or our residents, who were expected to know a whole lot more. And we were in charge. In my first year of internship, within the first six months, I had done sternal bone marrows. I had done LPs. I had done lines. We did all of this within the first year of staff training. And was that at NYU or had you moved on elsewhere after medical school? Montefiore. Montefiore. So Montefiore was first and second year mm -hmm. and I managed to spend most of my time in Morrisania, which was their city hospital in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And after your internship and residency training was done, where did you complete your cardiology fellowship? A year at receiving mm -hmm. when Richard Bing of Taosig Bing if you know your medical history, was a giant, lived to be a hundred, um, was chief. And he, I published my first stuff with him. And so you got to see your name and lights type thing with him. And he was a tremendous influence on my life. And then we left Detroit because Arnie, my husband, took a plane out here, deplaned, and said, I'm going to live here. So I actually thought about it because I had a job in New York ready for me. And a vacancy occurred here that Chetlin told me about. And I said, I want that job. And in three months, I had the job. What was your first job here like? What were your clinical duties? I came in as an associate. So I had the boards already in cardiology. 
and uh, Elliot Rapport was chief, and he was away a lot. We could do whatever we want, and um, I did. <laughs> I did whatever I wanted, and I developed a good relationship with nursing, and they actually wanted me to head up the CCU when um, the guy who was here left. And that's what I did. And I've been the, the medical director of the CCU ever since. And how is your job here split up in terms of time spent doing clinical work or teaching or doing administrative tasks? Administrative as little as possible. And even today, if I can do less than 10% administrative, I'm happy. Now, by administrative, it depends on what we're talking about. Committee work, some committees really get stuff done. And I don't mind being a, but, you know, policy and a lot of these committees, as little as possible. But I did whatever I want, and we had clinics at the time. So Dick Fine was around, had been around. Um, we had a clinic from the get-go and inpatients, and I loved it. And I just did a lot of work uh, as an inpatient attending and still do 10 weeks a year, which is more than anybody else except our newest faculty hire. I'd like to step back and ask a more general question about your early career. As you look back at that time, what do you think were your formative habits or behaviors or attitudes that you think might have been unique to you? I wanted to be a problem solver. So you got the problem, you focused on the problem, you solved the problem. I went into medicine because it was a challenge. And I wanted to always concentrate on personal best. And that's what I require of my own teams. So I expected the same thing of myself, and that was my upbringing, I think. Nobody forced me to do medicine. Um, nobody said I couldn't, but somehow getting to the root of something and doing my best to take care of the issue with what I could do at the time, depending on technology and technique and my own clinical abilities, that's what I was in there for, I'm trying to be great. But it seems to me if you'll take on a challenge and like it, you're going to be good at it. During your early career, how did you go about learning clinical medicine? For example, what did you read? I read textbooks, what were considered at the time to be authoritative. So that would be my base, to go to the textbook. I read quizzes. I took quizzes, um, textbooks, and, and journals. I had a lot of journals. And I had time to read them. And I also, we had groups that would kind of meet and hash out clinical problems. Some of this was done during Midnight Supper, which was great. We shared a lot of experiences um, among ourselves, by the way. And how did you structure your reading? Did you read on the job or at home? It was not on the job because we were not quite as busy as the county, but we admitted plenty of people. So on the job was difficult. You had enough support among the resident staff to say, look, I, I got crepitus in the belly here. Could you come with me and take a look? And it's perforated gallbladder. I well, we never forgot that. So we, we felt, we heard, we listened, we examined, and then I went home and read. How did you select topics to read? Cases, my cases. And I, I, to this day, I think people learn best from the cases they're taking care of. Not for some formal lecture about something they're not going to see. Um, that's okay as a student and maybe an intern to give 78 differential diagnoses. But if I have a patient that I didn't get what was going on, I'd read about that case that day and I'd read whatever I could get. And we had a, a very extensive library, even at that time. Books were cheaper, and um, we went to the library at our, at our schools. 
It sounds like your early career clinical reading was focused on the patients you were seeing in practice. This is something I've heard consistently in our other master clinician interviews. Um, to, to shift gears slightly, I also wanted to ask you about mentorship. In your early career, did you know anyone who you viewed as a mentor? And if so, who were they? The word mentor wasn't used. The concept wasn't used. You found somebody that you liked, got along with, who could teach you something. Very often, in my case, was a surgeon. And I actually thought of being a belly surgeon for a while. But then I thought, why would I get up at four in the morning? Um, so I found particular people that I could go to to help me with a specific problem. I don't like the idea, and I still don't. You may want to edit this out. <laughs> of having a mentor take you through four, five, six years of development, your interests change, your personality changes. So, no, um, I had many who I felt totally free to ask, who were willing to give an answer and time and respect, but no one person. I'm hearing that you had many people you could go to for different things. How did you select these senior physicians as references for questions or guidance? That came with getting older and learning what people really had to offer. Like when I was a, a medical student and there was a Chatterjee or a Rappaport or a Chetlin, I wouldn't have known it. Um, so the older you get, the more experience you have, the more you can recognize who you would want to be like. Could you mention any examples? Who were they? They were clinicians. They were clinicians who not only knew how to do and teach a physical exam, they could interpret data. They had a knowledge base that was pretty remarkable. So I knew about Chatterjee because he wrote about pacemakers and various other things way before I actually met the man. And then we'd get together at courses, we'd be on the same panel, and house staff would say, oh, but Chatterjee says, oh, but Chatterjee says. <laughs> so I finally realized, God, wouldn't it be cool to be able to do what he does? And then, of course, Chetlin was a physical diagnostic person of renown, world renown. So it, I wanted to be as good as they, and I wanted to be able to teach as well as they. And um, to that extent, that was an aspiration or an, a wish to emulate. Um, so in that sense, I suppose you could say that they were role models. Uh, we have a fellow now who says, Nora, I want to be you. But what he really wants is my kind of job. <laughs> I'd also like to ask you about teaching. Did you ever make any efforts to teach during your early career? We used to get a group of two or four second year students for eight weeks on cardiology, for example. And what I would do is I'd assign a couple of patients. They'd come in the night before. They'd spend eight hours if they needed to. They'd present the next day, and they'd present. They'd learn well how to present. Then we'd go to the bedside, and we'd do the exam. And do you feel like teaching influenced your professional growth in any way? I've always felt and still believe if you can't teach it, you don't know it. And what does that mean? That means you have to teach it in a clear manner, bringing to the um, area on which you're teaching everything that's relevant. That's the best answer I could give. Because if I'm going to give some kind of talk that makes sense or go to the bedside to demonstrate how to do a venous pressure thing, I'm going to make damn sure that I'm doing it right. So I'm going to, especially early on, I'm going to read a physical diagnosis book. I'm going to listen, and we had these. I'm going to listen to tapes. Now they're on the internet. You can actually listen to murmurs 
and heart sounds, etc. I did all that. It was fun. Medicine has to be fun. It cannot be nine to five. There's a, a sign Melody made in 5K8 that says, this is your life. It's up to you to make it a fun time. I'm totally with you. I think that intentionally searching for moments of joy in our clinical work and taking time each day to acknowledge those moments is a practice that can serve as a regular renewal of purpose for many of us. Shifting to, to my next question, during your training years and your early career, did you ever make any efforts to improve your skills with taking a history or performing a physical exam? We had, of course, no computers. So I remember typing out on little index cards, history questions, which I used as a student until I didn't need them anymore. So there was a discipline to the history taking that eventually I was able to you know, throw away the, the tools but I had the discipline. As far as the physical exam, if I had good residence, once I felt or heard it, you know, I, I didn't forget it because I knew I wanted to do it for a living. But the value of the um, recordings uh, cannot be overestimated. And also, Arnie, my husband, he being ahead of me, would take me up to Einstein, which is where he trained, just to listen to murmurs. Hmm. What a great date. <laughs> Cheap <laughs> and learning. I mean, what more could you ask? That's remarkable. <laughs> so it definitely sounds like you found some extracurricular opportunities to hear more cardiac murmurs. Did you do anything else to improve your exam skills? I'd have somebody come and, and verify the uh, verify the findings. Mm -hmm. Is this an S3 I'm hearing, or is this an opening snap? Hmm. And somebody would do that. Is this a plural friction rub, or is this a... And somebody would do that. There was always somebody to do that. It was not attending, but there was always somebody to do that. Hmm. Our attendings um, would not make rounds every day. They would make rounds once or twice a week, and we choose cases for them. And the non-professor group, the practitioners, pretty much knew what they were talking about. So they were able to show us, for example, central cyanosis. They showed us um, pitting edema. You don't forget that stuff. But you can't learn it in the R2 year. I mean, you're most impressionable and I'm sure you know this is true, Every, everybody knows, your learning curve is highest in your MS3, S4 years, I think. And the internship is a different experience because that's more technical. It's a, it's a different activity, but the actual learning of the skill, I think the curve is steeper as a student. I agree completely. I think there's really something there about the importance of learning the fundamentals carefully and completely during those most impressionable years. I also wanted to ask, during your early career, did you ever track patients over time to find out what had happened to them? I ask because you mentioned spending time in the clinic across the street, but also here in the main hospital over several years. And if you did track patient outcomes, what did you learn from doing so? Sure. Tells me I was wrong. It tells me, okay, there's a disconnect here. He's going to the cath lab or he's going over to um, see a good internist or he's going over to a hematology consultant because I'm out of my league here. Mm -hmm. So it helps me know what my limitations are. And it helps me recognize when things don't fit. And when things don't fit, and I try to get the house staff to understand this, the burden is on them to explain it. And if you come up with, I don't know why it doesn't fit, at least you've done the right thing. Did you learn anything else from seeing how your patients did over time? Yeah. It's a good question, actually. 
you learn that people can walk around with a cardiac output of one, ejection fraction of 10, and they're alive 15 years later. How, how can that be? So you learn natural history things. You learn that you can't predict very often and be right about it. You learn never to say, if you don't stop this, you're going to die because he may outlive you. You never say this to a patient. Um, so you learn that people survive despite medicine, which is a great lesson for doctors to know. Here, how come these people are still walking around while well, they're walking around <laughs> and they're holding a job down and they're still doing their plumbing? Who would have thought? So it gives you respect for the, the human body. It gives you a respect, it, put, it gives you a perspective. But you're not always right. Sometimes you save a life, no question. But you're not always right. And that's a great lesson to go through life with, I think. Well, we certainly appreciate all of your thoughtful insights here today. Before we conclude, do you have any other advice for the trainees or junior faculty in our audience who have set clinical excellence as an important career goal? No, with the exception of uh, you don't aim to be a master clinician. I have to come back to this personal best meeting a challenge, taking it on, you know, planning the approach. And if you do that well, you'll be, if not a master, a near master, you'll be damn good at what you do, I think. Dr. Goldschlager, thank you so much for your time and for joining us on the podcast today. I'd like to conclude this episode with a reading of one of my favorite quotes from the famous American essayist and poet, Ralph Waldo Emerson. He once wrote, I cannot remember the books I've read any more than the meals I have eaten. Even so, they have made me. Of course, here, Emerson tries to summarize the lesson that past experiences, past content consumed, past interactions we've had. They don't just fade into the past. They linger and shape us. They don't dissipate without a trace. They permeate our present realities at our fingertips, even if they aren't at the front of our minds or on the tips of our tongues. Emerson's quote reminds me of another from William Faulkner, who once wrote, The past is never dead. It's not even past. What does this quote by an American essayist and philosopher who was born over 200 years ago have to do with the practice of medicine today? When I think back to medical school and residency, I don't remember much detail about the individual lectures or small group sessions I attended, but I'm followed by a foundation of medical knowledge that somehow emerged as a consequence of those lessons. I don't remember any anatomy lab sessions in any great detail, but I do remember how it felt when I walked into the anatomy lab at NYU for the first time. I also remember how that lab was the birthplace of my professional senses of objectivity, equanimity, and detachment qualities which are essential to patient care. I don't remember the day-to-day -day hustle and bustle of my residency rotations, but I do remember the camaraderie of the house staff and the faces and stories of patients and the unforgettable lessons they taught me. In that sense, Emerson's and Faulkner's quotes contain an important and essential lesson, that perhaps the true cloak of our profession isn't a white coat, but rather our past narratives and experiences that still flutter around us on our flanks every day as we go about our work. So as you go about your day tomorrow, see the patients, write the notes, read the textbooks and journals, and handle matters commonplace or rare, intriguing or frustrating, don't forget to stop and take time to savor the experiences. Because years later, when the details have faded, those experiences will be carved, refined, forgiven, and filtered by hindsight, and will quietly make us who we are. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Master Clinician Project, featuring the truly great Dr. Nora Goldschlager. See you next time.